Well, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Jen Coyne, and we're going to get started here in a minute on the Corporate Transparency Act and Beneficial Ownership Interest Reporting. With that, um, I'll get started. Um, I'm here today presenting um, with my business partner, Brian Stinson. Um, we're from the Peak Fleet, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about us in a couple of minutes. But first, uh, I wanted to welcome you to the Mind What Matters business um, education series. Um, the series sponsors, really grateful to them, um, including On Point, um, Washington Labor and Industries Department, Pacific Source Health Plans, and Securitas. So thanks to them and to GBC for the support on this. Um, and tell you a little bit more about what we're going to cover today. Um, <clears throat> so. There's new reporting requirements, and honestly, um, you will invest probably more time in this session today than it will take you to comply with this, but we felt like um, folks weren't getting enough information about it out there, enough um, awareness, and so we wanted to hold this seminar to answer any questions, to let you know what it is, why it matters, why it's necessary, um, and what you need to do. Um, so we'll be going through that today. A little bit about me, about us. Um, if you see Brian pop up on the screen as well as a presenter, um, I'm Jen Coyne. I'm the CEO and co-founder with Brian Stinson, my business partner of the Peak Fleet. We are an organizational development company. Um, we focus on healthy cultures, leadership and team development, um, strategic planning, um, and we have a really strong values focus on the work that we do. Uh, we also happen to be the program um, directors for the GBC Business Pod. Um, we provide consulting and run workshops and networking events and cohorts. Um, and um, this program is available to everyone in the community um, at no charge to the participants. Uh, if you know anyone, um, some of you may be a part of this already. If if you um, aren't familiar and you would like any business assistance, this isn't just for brand new starting companies. We are addressing you know all kinds of issues like increasing market share, um, improving operations, funding and financing, managing risk, and there is a link at the um, chamber's website. You can see in the top banner. There's a spot for business pod and there's a link this link here um, that you can go to to sign up and set up an initial intro meeting with us so please do take advantage of um, all of those resources as well so to start um, we have a polling question and that is um, whether or not you had heard of uh, beneficial ownership interest before you saw the advertisement for this seminar. You go to the polling tab and you have a chance to um, just answer yes or no. Just gonna give me a feel for whether or not you had awareness of it. So it looks like um, for folks that are on here um, participating live, that it's about two thirds of folks that have heard of it and another third that hadn't heard of it. Um, and so we're glad you're all here today. It gives me a feel for um, what kind of awareness is out there because we are trying to um, help in making sure that people know about this uh, reporting requirement. advance here. There we go. Okay. So what is beneficial ownership interest? I think it actually went too far here. I'm going to bounce back. So um, in 2021, there was a new um, bill passed by Congress that enacted something called the Corporate Transparency Act. And the main goal of this is to prevent um, and, and combat money laundering, um, other you know, strange or illicit finance schemes um, and to sort of 
raise the visibility into who owns and has an interest in various entities to basically prevent this kind of money laundering schemes from happening. Um, and so it is a um, pretty basic level of reporting that you have to do. This does not take you a lot of time, but it is legally required by many companies um, doing business in the United States. And un, you know, unlike in the past where it's more public companies um, that have a lot or, or certain kinds of companies like banks and things like that, that have a lot of regulation and a lot of reporting, um, this Corporate Transparency Act actually affects a tremendous amount of businesses in the United States um, trying to gather information that previously was not available. So, um, probably slow. so out of the Corporate Transparency Act is born beneficial ownership interest reporting or BOI. So I'll talk about, you'll see BOI, BOIR. So effective at the beginning of this year, many different types of companies, and we're going to get into how do you know if you, this is required for you um, in, a, in a few minutes. But this BOI reporting that came about um, is reporting on basically who is got substantial control or, or ownership in different kinds of organizations. Um, something that I wanted to emphasize is that filing is simple. I've done it. If I can do it, you can do it. It's secured. It's also free of charge. And the reason why I emphasize that is because a lot of times when these kinds of reporting requirements come about, even with the Secretary of State, you might get third parties contacting you saying, we can help you do this or go to this link and, and fill this out. And they will ask to charge money. The government is not charging you to do this. So um, make sure that whatever links you go to are the directly to the um, financial crimes enforcement network links that I'm providing. The other good news about this is that it's not an annual requirement for you to file. So you file it once and then you file it again if your information changes. So we'll talk a little bit about the circumstances that that might happen, but things like ownership stakes changing, if you bring in a partner, if a partner leaves, things like that, then you'll need to update it. But otherwise, if nothing changes, you don't need to um, submit it again. There are about 32 million entities that are impacted by this. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we're doing this is to raise awareness for folks that you are that many people are required to do this and make sure that you have the uh, support needed to get it done. Something else um, that people are probably concerned about is privacy and security. Um, unlike some of the information that you see at the Secretary of State level when you file about your company, this information will not be publicly available, but the Financial um, Crimes Enforcement Network is authorized to disclose the information under certain circumstances. Um, you know, if there are investigations that law enforcement um, are going about, um, you know, with court approval, you know, subpoenas, things like that. Um, so basically, if you've got other authorities that are requesting the information, that could be provided. Um, but as far as financial institutions, other regulators, the general public will not have access to this unless you give your specific consent. So the next question that we have as a polling question is what type of business res registration does your company have? Um, I put the main ones that we are um, in contact with through the chamber, sole proprietorship, LLC, single or multiple owners. So it could be a partnership, it could be multiple partners, um, S Corp or C Corp, or if there's something else that we don't have here, please indicate that. Looks like most folks that are starting to answer are in the LLC and S Corp space. So you're in the right place because if you're in either one of those situations, this is going to affect you. Okay. 
So based on that, thank you for your answers on that. Um, who needs to file beneficial ownership interest reporting? Corporations formed in the United States, including also including limited liability corporations, subsection S, so S corps as well, limited partnerships, and basically if you're in the other space, any entity creating a, an organization where you're filing a document with the state. So in some cases it could be trusts. And so there's gonna be a lot of detailed scenarios and we'll try to answer some specific questions if you have them. But one of the things I wanna raise awareness about is there's actually some really great documentation available um, that the FinCEN has provided um, with checklists and some flow charts. And we'll give a couple examples of those that will help walk you through this so that you can determine if you're subject to filing. Um, this also applies to foreign entities registered in the United States. So, you know, obviously there are companies who may do business in the United States and have filed with the state of Washington, Secretary of State to be able to do business in the state. Um, they're looking for that as well. And in fact, if you think about the whole purpose back in the first slide I talked about, you know, they're looking to, um, to understand influence that maybe foreign, um, foreign entities or foreign governments may have in businesses in the United States. They want to understand and have it be very transparent that that's going on. So that's one of the reasons why the foreign entities have to be included. And if you have any questions at all, please throw them into the chat. I should get notified um, that you've got a question. Okay, here's where we start getting into the complexities of things. So there are a lot of exemptions that mean you don't have to um, apply for this. I apologize that there's no significance to the top row being blue. That's just a typo on my part. So there are 23 different exemptions. Some of them seem kind of obvious. So like number one, public companies. Public companies already have reporting requirements to the Securities and Exchange Commission that are going to unveil a lot of this information um, as far as you know, ownership stakes and things like that. Um, all of that stuff is, is, uh, is, is recorded already. So um, I mentioned banks, banks is in, banks, credit unions, any sort of depository institutions, they already have a lot of regulatory oversight that is, is sort of uncovering this information. Um, you know, other things that I'll note is that if you're tax exempt entity, so if you happen to be a nonprofit, this does not cover nonprofits. Again, um, there's a lot of different detailed things where there's other oversight that applies here. Um, but the other one that I really, the other two actually I want to highlight, number 21, number 23, number 21 refers to large operating companies, and we'll talk about the definition of that in a minute. It is possible that some of some of you who have LLCs or S corps, et cetera, who haven't been subject to reporting in the past, um, are also exempt because of large operating companies, and you've got other places that you're reporting things. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And the other is inactive, right? So if your entity has gone inactive um, and is no longer, you know, actively selling, moving money around, things like that, then it does not apply to the inactive entities. So all of this information that I'm presenting here is also well documented at the FinCEN website. So you can go back and look at this. And also this recording will be available again if you want to review anything. Okay, so one of the other things as we start talking about large, large organizations has to do with whether or not you have employees. So I'm curious to know whether or not your company has employees. And this would be, if, especially if you're an S Corp and you're your own employee, then count yourself in that. Um, if you um, are an LLC and you just have um, owners that get distributions, then the answer would be no to that question. Let's 
So it looks like from people answering that people do have employees, but um, you're kind of under the 20 person threshold or don't have employees. So how that pertains to all of this is one of those exemptions that I mentioned, which is the large operating entity. Um, a large operating entity um, does not need to file if your entity employs more than 20 full-time employees and has a physical office present in the United States and has greater than $5 million in gross receipts or sales. Um, I didn't wanna ask you about your sales because I feel like that's a private thing for, for you. But um, so if, you know, what I'm looking here as far as the folks attending live is that you would not meet the exemption criteria. But if someone's listening to the recording of this, if you meet these three criteria, then you can have an exemption. And this again has to do with that there are other mechanisms where um, you are able to be found, you're doing reporting in other places that will reveal kind of what's going on with your business. This is really intended as a, a net to catch uh, uh, the private businesses um, that don't have reporting requirements aside from maybe your tax return. Okay, so we're gonna get into what you need to file and where you need to file it. But the big reason why we're doing this now is because um, the due date is, is coming up soon for um, folks that have been in existence prior to 2024. So if your business has been in existence prior to January 1st, 2024, you have until the end of the year to do this filing. Um, if you were formed during 2024, technically speaking, you have 90 days from formation to um, go ahead and fill this out with the state. So uh, you, or sorry, 90 days from when you formed with the state. So like you, you filed, let's say, with the Secretary of State in Washington, you have 90 days to go out to FinCEN and fill this out. Um, if you've passed that, don't freak out. It's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, but I would say, like, let's say you formed your company in March of this year and you haven't complied with this requirement yet. Take some time this week. It should really only take you 15, 20 minutes to go comply with this and just get it done. Going forward, if you haven't created your entity yet, but you're planning to in 2025, 30 days within forming your company with your Secretary of State, you will need to fill this out. So they're giving us some buffer time to um, comply with the requirements here, but um, starting next year, it will just be 30 days. The other thing is once you've filed, if you have any changes that happen um, that require you to update your beneficial ownership interest report, then you have 30 days to do that. After that change, you become aware of that change. So change could be a company name or address, it could be change in the owners. Um, it also could be change in the beneficial owner's name, address, or unique identifying number. So um, in my case, um, in filing for our company, we used our uh, driver's licenses. So I imagine that once my driver's license expires, I will need to go and, and update that just with a new um, copy of my license. So that's just the kind of cadence you're looking at. So, you know, if you're um, on a four year cadence or something like that with your license, then that's probably how often you would need to update it. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about this other unique identifying number because your driver's license is not the only piece of identifying information that you could use to file with uh, FinCEN, um, but that is one of the ways. So I see Laura's got a question. I'll come back and, and look at that a little bit more detail um, in a minute. Um, but I'll give you a chance. Maybe you want to take um, the opportunity to go out and pull, if you're on your computer uh, looking at this, to and have the ability to pull up this website. 
um, you can kind of walk along with me to see where you need to file your report. Um, there's two ways that you can do that. There's an online system, um, which you just, you don't need Adobe Acrobat Reader or anything like that. It's just a form that allows you to submit everything and get confirmation immediately. Um, you also are able to download a transcript of what you submitted so that you can see whether or not you need to make changes and also have that as proof. Um, also, you can fill out a PDF version of it if there's if you'd like to fill it out offline um, and save as you go and all of that kind of stuff, then you can fill it out as a PDF, load it through the system through this PDF, and then again, download your transcript and confirmation. Um, so what, uh, Laura, I, I believe, and again, I would suggest that you walk through, um, the, the filing requirements just to confirm this, but because this is a national based thing, um, if you're an Oregon based S corp and you have a total of more than 20 employees in your company and your gross receipts are greater than, um, the, the limits that have been set, you should not have to file this. Um, I would err on the side of caution and just walk through the, um, you know, your circumstances specifically. Um, but this isn't like, uh, oh, in this state, we only have this many people in this state, we have more. It's sort of um, the totality of your company because um, it is a federal requirement, not a state requirement. They are just saying if you have, so this would be true with Oregon too, if you are filed with the Secretary of State in, in, uh, in Oregon, same, same thing would apply. Um, in, in the case of the Peak Fleet, we actually are an uh, Arizona registered business. So um, all of the, the stuff that we're talking about would be for Arizona, but, but we still have to comply because of the size of our business and the type of business it is. So hopefully that helped to answer and um, have these put the link there in the chat of where to file so you can kind of look along with it as well. Okay. So with all of this buildup, you're like, what do we have to provide? This sounds scary. Do not be scared because it's super easy and a lot of um, basic information. I think the most complex part about this is determining whose information you need to provide, not what information you need to provide, because that's pretty basic. Um, so when you go through the process, they're gonna ask you for the name of your company. They're, if you have a doing business as DBAs a file, they will probably ask you for that information as well. They're gonna ask what state that you have formed um, your organization in and a physical address. You cannot have a PO box. Again, this is about transparency. So similar to most secretary of states are gonna require a physical address for you anyway. My recommendation would probably be that you use that same physical address that you have with the secretary of states. Um, but you know, there's different circumstances as to why you pick different addresses, but you can't use a PO box. So you'll have to provide the physical address of your business. In some cases that might be your home. And I know that there can be concerns for folks about having their home address places. In this particular case, this isn't public information. So, um, you know, most likely it's going to be similar to where your tax return is, is going. Um, they're also going to ask for your tax ID number. So in many cases, that's going to be your EIN if you have filed that for one of those, and most people have. So there's two kinds of individuals that are going to be under consideration for whose informa individual information we need to have as far as who owns the company. Um, it's called beneficial owners and applicants. So if your business was formed in 2024 or later, the applicant piece applies to you. If you were a company prior to that, you do not need to provide applicant information. I kind of understand why. I also kind of don't understand why they don't require it for prior people. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that maybe people don't know who applied for it in the past. Um, but we'll talk about each of those. So beneficial owners will get into a little bit more detail about this, but 
It is any individual who either directly or indirectly um, exercises either substantial control over a, an entity or owns 25% or more of the entity. Um, in the case for the Peak Fleet, Brian and I both had to provide our information because we both own more than 25% of our company. Um, the applicant is going to be um, if someone else, let's say it is an agent or an attorney or someone like that, filed your documents to start the formation of your company, their information is going to be required as well. Sorry, having a cursor issue. Here we go. So. Who are beneficial owners? Let's get into some details about that. But first, I would love to understand um, in your particular case, if you have a formal board of directors, because this is gonna come into play in understanding who beneficial owners are in the company. So from what I see um, there, most people are saying that, no, you don't have a formal board. So I won't get into a lot of details about that, but why it's relevant. Okay, so there's two ways that you can become a beneficial owner. The first way is around ex exercising substantial control over the organization. So the types of people that would exercise substantial control can include board members, which is why I asked the question, right? Because those might be people you wouldn't think of necessarily as exercising substantial control or being a, a, a beneficial owner of an organization. Um, but in this case, they want to understand if there are people that are exercising influence over the decisions, you know, what money is being spent, where money is coming from in the organization, who has knowledge of what is going on in the company. So board representation, um, ownership, right? So actual um, monetary benefit and ownership over the organization or voting power, right? So if you're a C-Corp and you're issuing stock that has voting power that goes along with it, that is a direct way of being a beneficial owner, ex exercising substantial control. Um, senior officers, right? So we've seen over the, the years um, with Sarbanes-Oxley and different types of um, legislation being put in place that there's increasing accountability to senior leaders and organizations, you know, to, to be held accountable for what's going on in the companies. Um, and so this is no exception to that. Um, there's indirect ways that you could become a subs uh, beneficial owner and ex exercise substantial control. Um, so it could be that there are intermediate entities that own a company and through that you own more than 25% of a company, then that would be the case as well. Um, or if you're acting through someone else, you know, you have an agent voting for you or something like that, that could be um, considered substantial control as well. So 25% um, or more ownership interest is the other criteria for becoming a beneficial owner. Um, so very direct, again, if you have um, sole or joint ownership of, of an undivided interest in the company, that is a way that you're going to, you know, and it's over 25%, you're a beneficial owner. You benefit directly from that company. Um, again, through other individuals um, as agents, if you are still owning and controlling an intermediary that then gets you to over 25% ownership of the company, then that would be the case as well. And there's a lot of scenarios like this is, again, really basic information. If you are a sole owner of an LLC, you're 100% owner of it, it's going to be you. You're the one that's going to be the beneficial owner. You just need to provide that information. If you have, you know, the kind of 
situation where you've got, you don't meet the exemptions, but you've got employees, you've got uh, multiple owners, maybe you've got pass-through entities, things like that. It can get more complicated and you'll really want to step through it to find out who's who is um, needs to be on this report. So um, polling question here is how many um, owners or shareholders do you have in your company? Is it a sole proprietor? Is there two people? Is there um, more than three? Just curious to know kind of where folks land and, and whether we need to, to dig into some of the complexities. So it looks like for the folks, I think I think some people said, you know, this doesn't apply to me. I'm I'm out of here. That's great. That's the intent of this as well, right? If you find out in the first five minutes that this is not something that you're responsible for, happy to um, have you duck out and and save some time for yourself. Um, looks like here mostly we're talking about one and two um, owner companies, and so in that case, you are the substantial controller you are the one with the beneficial ownership. And so it's your information that, that you'll need to provide. Okay, so I'm not gonna belabor this. We'll talk a little bit about the one at the bottom here because we're really talking about S corps or LLCs where there's probably not a lot of folks. So kind of this one on the right and um, the one on the bottom. Right, so you're basically, this is a simple division, right? You should probably know how much of it you own. Um, if your interest divided by the total capital um, in your company exceeds 25%, or that voting power because of that exceeds 25%, then you should be including those individuals in your report. These computations are clipped almost directly from the uh, the documentation that FinCEN has. And so again, you can go through their little guide and it can help you compute some of it. So here's just an example to understand the complexities you can get into. And there's one special, one special thing here because some folks do have employees I wanted to mention. So let's say we're talking about a corporation here, they're issuing stock and it's owned by three individuals, 50, 40, and 10. So you can see in the triangle here, the person that owns 10% of the stock does not need to be identified as on the BOIR. The individuals A and B here that own 50 and 40% respectively do. Now, the other wrinkle is that here's somebody up here in this green dot up here who is ex um, exercising substantial control without having ownership of the company. So if you hire a president or an executive that exercises a lot of control over the decision-making, you may need to include them as a beneficial owner because they ex exert substantial control, even though they don't own anything in the company. Here's the LLC, similar situation, right? Here's a partnership. 50-50, and you've got two people managing the company, one who's individual A, who is uh, also um, owns membership in that LLC. Here's somebody out here who doesn't have an ownership stake, but again, they're a manager, they're a senior executive, they're exercising control. That person needs to be included as well. Okay, here's some exceptions to, if you have to respond, to the reporting requirements, but these circumstances are um, true. These people do not need to be included. So minors, um, tax advisors, CPAs, um, most cases, attorneys or other intermediaries don't need to be included on the report. Um, so your company still has to file, but those people don't have to be named, okay? so. There may be circumstances where a minor child for some reason has an ownership stake in a company. That's a different circumstance. So um, employees that exert substantial control in a company, let's say it's a corporate controller or something, but if they're not a senior officer named in the company, 
um, also, then they would be exempt from having to be on the report. <clears throat> someone who is eventually going to inherit. So like if you're someone that has a sole owner LLC and you have a, a child that will eventually inherit the, the stake in the business, um, but that has not happened yet, they do not need to be included. And then also if you have banks that have an interest sort of liens or um, something to do with loans that need to be repaid, then um, they do not need to be included if that is the only interest that they have. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna cover this one briefly. I don't think I had a polling question about when your entity was formed. So I'm just gonna cover this briefly in case you're aware of or are a, an entity that was formed after January 1st. There's some extra folks that need to be disclosed. So there's two different categories of, of folks. So the first category is a direct filer. So let's say you are a sole owner of an LLC. You filed that document this year to create um, that LLC in the state of Washington, let's say. Um, you physically or electronically filed that document. You are considered a direct filer applicant. Again, in this particular case, it's just you repeating some of the same information twice, once as an applicant and once as a beneficial owner. The second category though, is like if you had an attorney file it on your behalf, then you need to put not only yourself in, in that report, but also the attorney, right? This comes back to if they're sort of like trying to trace out what's going on with this company, and they're looking to investigate something that looks wild to them, that they have points of contact and they know who, who is responsible for creating these entities. In no case will there be more than two applicants. It's gonna be you know, the director, who's directed and controlling it, and then who's filing on your behalf. That would be the max. Again, for most of us, um, that isn't, going to apply, but it is going to apply for folks that are creating companies this year and moving forward. So um, in here, we've got a couple of examples. I sort of have mentioned this already. Um, you know, we'll just go through example two, because I think that's the more complex one. If individual A is creating the company um, and then they direct someone else, individual B, to file them, individual B directly files the documents that create the company, then both A and B are applicants. In the other scenario, you're doing all of the filing and you're the owner, then you only have that one. Okay, so now again, like let's reveal what information must be disclosed. It's actually not a lot. So for both applicants and beneficial owners, what you have to provide is your name, your date of birth, your physical address, and a government ID. Um, it could be passport, it could be driver's license. Um, you have to take a picture of it and upload that. You also do have the option, if you would rather not provide your government ID, you can apply to get what's called a FinCEN ID number. And then you can use that as a proxy instead of your government issued ID. And there's an additional process for that. Um, Maybe you don't have these kinds of IDs or you don't feel comfortable having that information, then you might wanna go through those extra steps. But for most of us, we'll just take a copy of our driver's license. Okay, so what happens if you do not do it? So um, I'm kind of sorry to say that if you're here, you now, um, know about this. And so if you don't do your report, you're kind of willfully failing to comply. I, I kind of jest a little bit, but you know, I, I have had people comment to me when I brought this up, like, well, how can they penalize us or how can they make us do something that they aren't telling us about? And, um, you know, this is going to take some time for all 32 million people or all 32 million entities that are subject to this to become aware, to get them filed. People are gonna be late. This is just the reality of life. Um, but technically speaking, if you're willfully, either falsely, fraudulently, or just 
not um, filing your report, they can fine you up to $500 each day um, with a fine up to $10,000 or jail time. Um, again, if you're like, oops, I, I didn't do it and I'll do it right away and do it, I really, you know, they're not looking to um, impose a lot of penalties, especially jail time um, on people. Um, but, you know, it is a responsibility just like filing your, you know, revenue disclosures, filing your tax returns, all of these things. This is something that needs to get done. Um, they can also come after the agents and the other applicants. So um, kind of getting toward the end of, of where we're at today, um, there are some actually excellent resources um, available to guide you through this process if you have any questions. Obviously, as I mentioned, I offer again, if you have questions, you want to sit down and you want any help walking through it or determining whether or not you're subject to it, please reach out to Brian or I as part of the business pod. Um, but there is a detailed small business assistance guide at this link here. Maybe we can throw that into the chat as well. It is available in 12 different languages, so it should be helpful to most everyone that needs to do it. Um, they've got a section of frequently asked questions that are very detailed. And then, of course, just as a reminder, this is where you actually go and file. So like I said, you know, it probably took me 15 minutes to do the process. It's not um, difficult if you have that uh, identifying information, your government IDs. Um, you know, I know I had to go ask Brian for his and things like that. So when you get ready to do it, if you can have everyone's identifying information collected, it will speed the process along and allow you to use the online um, submission process more easily versus having to use a PDF. Um, but, you know, maybe you want to print out that PDF and go collect information and then and then go through the, the online process to submit it too if you want to collect that information. So with that, if you have any questions for me and Brian, um, like I said, you can sign up for the business pod or you can contact us at gvcpod at thepeakfleet.com. You're always welcome to contact the chamber. They'll put, put you in touch with us as well. Um, you can see the link here, vancouverusa.com slash business pod is how you can sign up for the business pod. We offer, again, workshops, coaching and consulting, networking and cohorts. So there's more, more to it than just um, the beneficial ownership help if you would like it. Um, and with that, that's that's how you can get started. And I think that that's all that I, I have for you today. All right. Well, thanks so much and good luck with filing and good luck with uh, your upcoming season in business.